Charles Dickens' novel, A Tale of Two Cities, opens to the famous line, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. To me, that sounds like today in the world of cancer research. Every day, we hear or see headlines on the positive side of new treatments using terms such as the jackpot of immunotherapy, immunotherapy prolonging life, game-changing advances, new paradigm for treating cancers. And in the financial news, we hear about large pharmaceutical companies buying and investing in gene and cell companies for as much as $11 billion. On the negative side, we see the reports that the FDA put a clinical hold on CAR T-cell programs or suspended a new clinical trial for immunotherapy because of safety concerns. Today, if you follow the news on the cancer front, it feels like sometimes you cannot open a newspaper, a magazine, a journal, or go online without seeing the term immunoncology. Recently, the FDA made history by approving the first gene and cell therapy for cancer. This is for pediatric and young adult acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients, and it's the first of a new class of drug for immunotherapy called CAR T cells. I'll come back to that later, but first, what is the immune system? One definition is that it's a complex network that functions to protect our body from foreign substances. This network uses interacting cells, cell products, and cell-forming tissues to defend the body from infectious agents and malignant cells. It also removes cellular debris from the body. Bottom line, our immune system is both a policeman and a garbage remover. The immune system includes many organs and cells, such as the thymus, the spleen, lymph nodes, lymph tissues, stem cells, T cells, B cells, natural killer cells, macrophages, and neutrophils. I have spent a lifetime on a journey to try and understand the immune system. And for me, it began in 1983 when I was an intern in a hospital in Johannesburg, South Africa. I was drafted to be the intern on the, first, the hospital's first ever bone marrow transplant. The patient was a young child suffering from a plastic anemia. This is when the immune system destroys the bone marrow. And to this day, we still don't understand exactly how and why. The bone marrow is that part of the body that makes the red cells, the white cells, the platelets, and the immune cells. Sadly, the child died of an infectious complication but the experience made me determined to pursue the field of blood and marrow stem cell transplantation. So here's some of the key things I've learned. The immune system recognizes our body as self. And in order to protect us, it must be able to differentiate the self from the non-self, meaning foreign entities like viruses, bacteria, funguses, and yes, malignant cells. Our immune system successfully recognizes many foreign threats, from influenza to transplanted organs. And in the case of fighting the flu, we work to strengthen those responses. And in cases like transplant, we work to suppress those responses. So here's the big question. Why does the immune system fail to recognize your body is developing cancer? This question is the basis of the new immunotherapy research and clinical approach. And over the course of many years of pursuing blood and marrow stem cell transplantation, and through my work in pediatrics, adolescent and young adults cancer, we have learned to successfully treat many liquid tumors, such as acute leukemia, with bone marrow transplant using bone marrow-derived stem cells. And something surprising happened. The transplant therapy created a new side effect that we realized that we could use to our advantage. This side effect is called graft, and I'll spell it, G-R-A-F-T, graft versus host disease, or GVHD. That's when the immune cells from the donated material attack the patient's normal cells. The graft is the donated material, and the host is the patient. Again, graft versus host disease. 
Obviously, graft-versus-host disease can prevent the transplant from working. It can even kill the patient. But then we realized that we could use graft-versus-host disease and harness it for our favor. And what if instead of graft-versus-host disease, we had graft-versus-tumor or graft-versus-leukemia? And while researchers were looking at ways to prevent graft-versus-host disease, a new cell emerged, the T cell of the immune system. This T cell is a double-edged sword. It can cause graft-versus-host disease, but it can also be responsible for graft-versus-leukemia. And scientists thought if you could remove this cell in the lab using something called T cell depletion, you could prevent graft-versus-host disease. So they tried it. And the good news is they did prevent graft-versus-host disease, but the bad news is the patient's tumor was coming back. In the mid-1990s, Stephen McKellen and his collaborators in Memorial Sloan Kettering decided that if you could give small amount of T cells back after you did that T cell depleted transplant, you could prevent graft-versus-host disease and you could make the cancer not come back. And this therapy became known as donor lymphocyte infusion, and it is one of the scientific underpinnings of the CAR T cell world. Are you with me so far? I admit this is a complicated story, but research is a long and winding road, and we often have to go through these twists and turns to make a great discovery. So let's fast forward to today. I could give you a long list of pioneer researchers who've advanced this field, and some of them won Nobel Prizes. The modern field of immunotherapy could not exist without the work of the transplant teams, the immunologists, the advent of the discovery of the ability to make monoclonal antibodies, the molecular biology techniques that was needed to bring everything together. We now stand on the brink of new therapies being made available. We have all the ingredients of our immune system to be able to use to harness against cancer. So let's go back to that basic question. What's going on when the immune system does not recognize cancer as non-self? And one theory about this is called cancer immune editing. The hypothesis is that we're developing cancer cells all the time. We know that billions of cells are being regenerated in our body every day, and that during cell divisions, changes occur that can lead to a cancer cell being formed. In other words, cancer is not a freak aberration, but cancers are normal. And our immune system takes care of the majority of these cells, and we never know we've had cancer or had cancer cells. And obviously, when this goes right, we call it the equilibrium phase because the immune system sees the cancer cell as non-self and destroys it. But sometimes the cancer cell escapes this immune surveillance. And when that happens, we develop full-blown cancer. And for reasons we don't understand, these surviving cancer cells get a, a network of supporting cells and proteins that protect it from the immune system. It's as if the cancer becomes a wolf in sheep's clothing, and our immune system looks at it and says, no problem, that's me. So the cancer has developed a kind of stealth mode that blocks the immune system. Jim Allison, about 20 years ago, was researching this problem. He was one of the first to realize that you could reverse the stealth blockade by using new molecules, and he can activate the immune system to respond to the cancer cells and destroy the tumors. This led to new and exciting drug treatments. And two of those Nobel Prize winners I alluded to, Kohler and Milstein, created and developed what we call monoclonal antibodies. And from that, we got a powerful new class of drug called an immune checkpoint inhibitor. And in 2017, 100,000 patients will be treated with drugs that will be developed from this line of research. These checkpoint inhibitors are the basis for all the new excitement around immunotherapy. But is this excitement warranted? We have a lot of exagger exaggerated claims going on, so it's important to establish, is this hype or is this real? My answer is it is both. On the one hand, these cells these drugs simplify our current understanding and limit opportunity to one aspect of a very complex immune system. And becoming too narrow in our focus can be a problem. On the other hand, we've seen remarkable responses in a small percentage of patients. One of the first diseases this was tried on was metastatic melanoma. 
and we saw small improvements in the overall survival rate. Unfortunately, this did not work for the majority of patients, but when it did, it was truly amazing. Today, they're long-term survivors from that original patient cohort, and the next generation of these immune checkpoint inhibitors allow the immune switch to be turned back on and attack the non-self. The more we learn about the immune system, the more complex we realize it is. It's like shining the light into a dark room. We get answers, but sometimes many more questions. And if we want to use the immune system for all patients with cancer, we need to develop a systems approach. And I'm going to use the analogy of a car. If we, we need to learn to change the oil in the engine while it is still running, and at the same time, change the tire while we're still driving. And that's because the immune system succeeds by using both spatial and temporal approaches to when different molecules and cells come into play. And every day, new molecules are being discovered that we realize are needed to make the immune system work. So I believe it's overly simplistic to believe that just one or two molecules are all that's needed to stop the immune system from attacking cancer cells. And it really is overly simplistic to believe if you give a patient an immune checkpoint inhibitor, you get a universal cure. The reality is checkpoint inhibitors work for only 10 to 15% of cancer patients. Unfortunately, this nuanced view has not been well understood. And as I said, there's a lot of media coverage and corporate messaging suggesting that to cure cancer, we just have to give an immune checkpoint inhibitor as a silver bullet. Well, that's not possible. And for me, the more important question is, why is it that the immune checkpoint inhibitor is not working? And if we knew that, maybe we could trick the immune system to reactivate the cell in the same way the cancer cell tricked it to stop noticing that these were cancer cells. And to do this, could we use new molecules? So let me answer this by surveying the state of the field at the moment. We've seen a great success story in children who would have died from acute lymphoblastic leukemia, smiling happily, celebrating birthdays. This group of children for whom all other therapies had failed to put them into remission now are going into remission 83% of the time and this was made possible by creating a new molecule, a mixture of cells, a chimera of the T cells and B cells in what we are calling chimeric antigen receptor T cells, or much easier to say, CAR T cells. And the first studies have been done, and the first treatments of this class are now FDA approved for B cell leukemia and lymphoma. But even here, we have good news and bad news. When that new chimeric T cell recognizes a cancer and destroys it rapidly, it has a new negative side effect. It releases proteins that can put the patient into the intensive care unit. And we call this cytokine release syndrome. And it can actually kill the patient. The good news is we're learning how to recognize it early and we can intervene and salvage the patient. And we actually use another immunotherapy drug, another antibody to try and reduce this risk. At the same time that the CAR T cells are destroying the cancer, it also permanently destroys the patient's normal B cells. And this puts the patient at a lifetime of infectious risk. And we have to replace those B cells with a very expensive IV substitute that is given monthly, and this is for life. Clearly, when it comes to the immune system, there are no easy answers. And at least so far, there are no cheap solutions either. Yes, it's amazing and wonderful to see our patients doing well, but the estimated cost of immune checkpoint inhibitors run into the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And in some cases, CAR T cells have cost up to a million dollars per patient. And no matter how much money we spend, we have to face the sobering and tragic reality that the majority of patients' tumors do not respond to the current immunotherapy approach. We still have a lot of research to fund and to perform. And with over 130 companies now getting into the field of immunotherapy and the US government funding numerous initiatives, I believe we will see real scientific progress translated to the patient and to the clinic in relatively short order. And by that I mean years and not decade. I'm confident 
that we will find a way to use the immune system to treat cancer. And I believe we're going to find a way to help many more patients. And this approach, combined with other anti-cancer therapies, gives us strong reason to believe that hope is on the near-term horizon for cancer patients. And hopefully, as Charles Dickens said, we'll be in the best of times. It will be an age of wisdom and definitely not an age of foolishness. Thank you.